You could do um, James Arminius. So though that gives you plenty that you can yeah. choose from in this this week's coming. Okay. So. All right, uh, we're dealing primarily with um, trying to look at how now the church responds to what is happening in, in this particular period of time. I guess what, when we're dealing with the Middle Ages, I'm going to just kind of set the time frame as about the, the last part of the 6th century. So we're going to give you the date of 590, and we're going to stretch it through... Uh, 1085. So we've got about 500 years here that we're going to be dealing with and uh, in this particular period. Now, actually the Middle Ages will run up to, including scholasticism, will run up through the 1300s into the 1400s. But we're starting to see, um, by that time, we're getting some major reform cries uh, going out in you got John Huss that appears on the scene about 100 years for Luther, before Luther, early 1400s. So by the 1400s, your, people are getting tired of the Renaissance popes and the Renaissance church. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, next time. Well, I guess I could get into this one. But we'll, we're going to try to, we'll see how far we get. When we're dealing here with the, the popes, and the rise of the, um, of the church at this particular point, the, what we call the early Middle Ages, we're going to start there, because we need to start with that coming out of this particular age, we're getting in now to the period where the church and the empire are kind of in, in, in troubling times. Uh, troubling times in the sense that the empire had moved itself, its center, under Constantine to Constantinople. By making that move, he literally pulled the Senate and uh, the seat of government from one side of the empire to the other side of the empire. A major move. I mean, you're talking major, major move. And this, in a way, is bringing about the collapse of the empire. Uh, First of all, you're moving it in a, in a totally different cultural setting, closer to the Greek world and further away from the Latin world, even though there's still a Latin-speaking group. But you'll begin to find that as they move themselves into that Greek arena, the Greek language begins to dominate the church as well as the empire in that side. The second thing that you're going to see happen is by moving the major seat of government, so the wealth goes to Constantinople as well. Uh, and by making that particular move, that weakens uh, the areas around Rome. So you're facing the collapse of the old Roman Empire. When I say the collapse of the old Roman Empire, I'm talking about the empire with the seat of government right there in Rome itself, in Italy. So by pulling it out, you're weakening that center. And by weakening that center, uh, we're going to see then the, 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 the whole idea of the traditional Roman government start to, to fall apart. Now there's a lot of activity going on during this particular time. And um, as we're beginning to see the, the government of the Roman Empire uh, switch places, you're also going to see what happens to the, what I'm going to call, I'm going to start identifying the Western Church and the Eastern Church. You need to start understanding this differentiation in your mind because eventually this, the church will split East and West. And when you split the Eastern segment off, you now have the Orthodox Church. And then in the West you have the Catholic Church. And so these two began to separate. Now, it starts when Constantine moves. That's the seed of the demise of the unity of the church. Now, they've been fighting for 400 years or to get some kind of world domination of the message. That's what they felt their commission was to do in the Great Commission. But now they're going to see themselves 
uh, began to tear apart. And a little bit of what our discussion was about in the times uh, that we'll see it, we're going to have a cultural divide because the East is going to be East and West is going to be West and the two will never come together uh, because they're just two different mindsets, two different languages, two different ways of doing things. So as we begin to see the ecclesiastical structure begin to develop because of the demise of the centerpieces of government here in Rome, uh, things are beginning to happen. Now, Things begin to happen because Christianity itself, by the very nature of its ethic, begins to deteriorate, some think, the ethics of Rome. Now, Rome was not built out of being, you know, milk toast attitudes toward everybody around them. They were built on a short sword and a strong spear and, you know, the Roman armies and hobnailed boots and everything that went around them. They marched forward, and their legions were indestructible, except when they faced Carthage and that. I mean, on the west, on the far east, they ran up against the old Medes and, uh, and, and Persian Empire. They, the uh, Carthaginians, they just couldn't quite handle. So they kind of backed off there. They were always being thrust in front of the Germans, and they constantly were fighting the Germans, having difficulty there. They, they called them the Celts, and they were the or we call them the you know, Celtics or Celtics, whatever you want to, but uh, the Celts uh, who were pretty much dominating before Rome came to power. They dominated everything from Britain all the way down into Asia Minor. And they became known not as Celts, but as Gauls. And in fact, to give you a little tidbit here, Paul's book to the Galatians was really about his book to the Gauls or to the Celts <laughs> because they were one great big string of power all across northern Europe who gave rise to the um, not just the Irish <laughs> but the whole land of Britain was controlled by the Celts northern Germans which eventually Anglo-Saxons and on down along the Danube that whole area that came into what is today Bulver that uh, what we call what uh, eastern Eastern Europe, but that lower segment uh, of the of the Slavs and all that down right into Asia Minor, which is now controlled by the Turks. So all of that's Celt. And if you're of any extract of Northern European, you if you do a DNA test, you'll probably find you got probably close to 50% Celtic blood in you <laughs> from DNA tests. We found that out. My brother did a um, did a um, background, and we did a DNA. And uh, based upon some reading and uh, in Robert's, what's his name? I want to say Bob Sires. There's a book written, printed by uh, an author out of uh, out of uh, England. Uh, he's uh, getting off here, but <laughs> allow me to take a little side trip here. Uh, he he uh, what was the name of the book now? It had to do with I think it was called Celts, uh, Vikings, and Celts, Vikings, and Brits, or something to that effect. And it was about the bloodline in England. And of course, we, we read the book, my brother and I, and we said, all right, we need to find out our DNA. Because it, it's about him doing DNA research there at Oxford. So uh, we went on history.com, uh, and we got a test, and my brother took it, and set it off. And the name Emptage is actually French. And yet our English background puts us in England, and we've got records. When I was over at Cambridge, I actually found records of emptages that went back to the 480s in this in, in a place called uh, well, eastern eastern England on the Horn there, called the Isle of Thanet in that area. So I found the records of this back there, and actually went back and visited a, a cousin, sixth cousin, who lives in England, and she took us all around the old empty stomping grounds. <laughs> so anyway, we got to see all that, and. Uh, so, and the fact that this is where the Norsemen had come in and landed, and the fact that Emptage is a French name, and the, I just had this strong feeling that we weren't French, we're not really English, we're probably, we're probably Norsemen, or coming from Normandy with, with the Conqueror, who knows. 
So he does the DNA test, and by golly, we're 60% Norse, and the other part's self, Kelp. And sure enough, my suspicions were right. My red hair, well, you can't see it now, but I used to be <laughs> And uh, I, I just had that strong feeling. So, so we are Norsemen. Well, we started doing, you know, we can't find our name in the Doomsday Book. We can't find it in any of the records. But my wife, believe it or not, on her side, she has a real pedigree. They've traced the, she's a, uh, her name is Oni, but it's a derivation, uh, comes from the word Olne, or on, Olni, and uh, her background was that her, her people came over with William the Conqueror for certain, fought, you know, and then was given lands, and when we were in Cambridge, we went over to the little town of Olney, which was about 20 miles away, visited the town from which her family came. They came, uh, so they were, they were definitely Normans, definitely had pedigree, they were definitely in the Doomsday Book. They also came over to, they were Puritans, came to America in the Great Migration of 1634. Her ancestor was Thomas Olney, who went with Roger Williams and started Providence and the colony of Rhode Island. He was a member of the First Baptist Church of Providence, got on a hiatus with the pastor, broke off and started the Second Baptist Church, <laughs> and they've been breaking off ever since, you know. <laughs> she had an Olney that was on, uh, there was an Olney that was a part of uh, Eisenhower's cabinet. So, I mean, you know, they're New England people. I mean, they, they, you know, the empty just can't find that kind of degree going behind their name, but my wife's side. Oh, anyway, enough of that story. But anyway, just, I don't even know how I got off on that. Anyway, we're, uh, we're looking here. Sorry, people, we can strike, strike that if you want to. Uh, so, anyway, we're talking about uh, the Celts, I guess. That's how I got started on that whole story and a whole part of this area. So, as we're looking at the, 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 the development of, um, of this, uh, ideals of, of the church, the church now is beginning to deteriorate, uh, its values, I should say, is starting to deteriorate the, the aggressive nature of the empire. Now, if you read uh, Gibbon's uh, volumes on the rise and decline of the, whole, of the Roman Empire, he would, he would blame Christianity, you know, for the, the whole falling away of the Roman Empire. Well, what were some of the things that happened? Well, you have these ideals that, that, uh, that are being presented by the church that go against uh, the whole idea of the former Roman Empire in terms of, well, for example, you know, uh, gladiator games or serving in the army. I may have touched on this the last time. But one of, some of the things that we understand here that one of the things that we talked about was the centralizing idea of the emperor cult. That did pull people together. And it brought people unifying the emperor empire as a whole. The second thing was that this pacifistic uh, attitude of the, of the Christianity, uh, the Romans, again, couldn't be as fierce maybe because we've got a different attitude that we're taking toward people. And the very fact that later, as things begin to develop, the Christian, Christian empire, the, the new one developing under, say, Pope Leo, for example, one of the first and earlier popes, as things began to fall apart, it was the church that actually held the old Roman Empire together. Well, here's a few of the primary things that you've seen this. I just kind of give you a, an outline of what this Middle Ages is going to look like here. So. Uh, we're on this particular grid. So you've got the beginning of councils that begin to bring in Christianity as the religion of the world. The start up with some of the good popes, or great popes, I should say. Leo I, Gregory I. Um, these are some of the ones that uh, you're going to pay attention to in your readings if you haven't already. Uh, and we're going to kind of follow down through this. The high Middle Ages, also the high point, high water mark of, of the church and power of the popes. They start declining after here. 
and then when you get to the Reformation, about 400 years, say 1100 is probably the high water mark of the Roman Church um, with the power of the popes. Things begin to decline after that, and we get then to Reformation. Um, the church organized its style after the Roman political system. And at the beginning of what we call the Middle Ages or the medieval period, uh, Christendom was divided into what we call five great patriarchs. And these were Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And you'll notice that all of these are in the east for the, except for Rome. So early on, the church is situated in its power structure in the east, over against uh, the west. These uh, particular patriarchs, then, were subdivided down into providence, supervised by an archbishop who had a great cathedral, which was located in the chief city within his particular province. Then it was organized from the patriarchs and the archbishops to the bishops. And the bishops ruled over diocese, and the diocese then were again subdivisions of the, um, of the uh, providences. And then below that then were non-episcopal orders of priests. And when I say non-episcopal, I'm talking about those who were non-governments. So your governors are your bishops, your archbishops, your patriarchs, and then eventually we'll have a pope here. So we're following that Roman model. But in the non-episcopal orders are the priests, the deacons, the subdeacons, the readers, the cantors. Um, these were all those who were doing ministry on the local level to the people. Now a priest had to be 35 years old, a deacon or a subdeacon at least 25 years old, and a reader or a cantor had to be at least 18 years old. And of course, at first, marriage was allowed, but then it wasn't encouraged, but it certainly was allowed. During this time, as the church begins to develop, oh, let me see here. I'm going to jump in here real quick, take a look. Why don't I go over these slides first, and then I'll come back to the church. Uh, some of the characteristics that we're looking at, I've just kind of started to lay out the church here, the things I want to review here in the slides, that um, these particular characteristics that we're giving are not really talking or describing the East. Now, the East is going to have its own set of problems here by the early 600s, but 200 years prior to that, in the 400s, in the late beginning of the 500s, we're, we're dealing with a different set of problems here. So in the, in the West, we have the decay and the fall of the empire because of the barbarian invasions that begin to happen. And your maps in the book begin to show the Visigoths and the Vandals and the Lombards and various groups that began to come in, the Huns, as they began to invade the empire and come down and sack Rome by the late 400s. And, you know, that's when you've got, for example, uh, the sacking of Rome stirs up the book questions, questions on the part of the people. How could God allow his holy city to come under destruction? And then you have uh, Augustine writing this great book called City of God, which tries to answer the questions of rape and pillage and destruction. And he approaches this from the angle that this is not our home. You know, Christians are not to put their trust in empires, not to put their trust in things here on the earth, but our city is not the city that we have constructed with hands. It's the city of God that is being constructed spiritually. So in a way, it was somewhat of an eschatological message in one way, in the sense of trying to help people who were putting their trust in the material to refocus their, their trust in a different direction. Now, mind you, this whole eschatological message of the church, it was beginning to decline as far as an emphasis. Remember we talked about early on that there was a strong emphasis on the soon return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was very, part, very much a part of the 
first century church, during the persecutions it was heightened during the second, third century. But by the time the empire comes around in third, fourth, fifth centuries, sixth centuries, you have a decline in this anticipation of the soon return of Jesus. And so the message moves from Christ coming to establish his kingdom on earth to a beginning focus upon the church establishing the kingdom on earth. So we go from the spiritual kingdom emphasis to a material kingdom emphasis. And so this is, this is probably another mentality or a modern, you know, mental leap that begins to change the way we focus. You think about that for a minute. When we move from seeing the church as a spiritual organization to a pure human organization, what kind of attitudes then begin to crop up? What kind of things begin to happen? I want you to think about that as you read church history. Begin to see how it moves from... It, it, these are kind of like waves. They come and they go. But a wave of a spiritual emphasis over a very, what I would call, almost secular emphasis of the church. And we'll see it here in Europe. You'll see it in the various forms and expressions of the church, even in the Protestant Reformation. It will go through its own waves between a secular ideal or a spiritual ideal. It just keeps flopping back and forth. And sometimes we look at revivalism as a way of reinvesting ourselves into the spiritual form of the church and, and, and moving away from a more secular or um, materialistic idea of the church. So keep that in mind as you're working your way through the material. Um, and so as we begin to, and as the, the slides talk about here as having a, a, an emphasis uh, that there is a purging going on. Um, a purging of the empire, a purging of the church through these Germanic invasions, that there's a change in the ideals. Gibbons did point this out in his book in terms of some of the reasons that you can contribute to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, interestingly, if you look at this, what do you think? Uh, inordinate love for sports, <laughs> collapse of morals and ethics, mm -hmm. high divorce rate and breakdown of the family, exorbitant taxes and expanding welfare system, uh -oh. erosion of patriotism. <laughs> Sounds like America. Is that the New York Times from yesterday, or is this a lesson <laughs> on the breakdown of the Roman Empire? <laughs> Mind you, Gibbons wrote his books back in the late 1800s. So he wasn't looking at or mirroring something of 1950. <laughs> 1955, they said America had reached its pinnacle and it was on its decline. Yeah. And the reason they gave 1955 as the turning point was the year Elvis Presley came out with uh, Hound Dog and... <laughs> <laughs> So we're blaming Elvis. It's all Elvis's fault. The king brought us down, right? I can live with that. It could be worse. Yeah. Oh, gosh. But do we really have to include the the, the, the sports? The love of sports? Can we like gloss over that one? And, and can we just yes. the, the rest? Can we over that? It brings us together. Yes, it does. Patriotism of sports. And I guess, I guess so. the kids tear us apart if you're up for that team of Yeah, you're a Michigan but, fan. <laughs> but I'm neither. How, so. close, how close is gladiatorism to uh, <laughs> football? <laughs> well, the way the game's being played. <laughs> Might be getting now that they don't want to, what is it? They're trying to rule out uh, runbacks and yeah. kickoffs. They're trying and to rule out everything that's, that makes it fun. It's too hand yeah. league now. Yeah. Okay, we're just gonna we're gonna get back to flag football, right? Yes. <laughs> no touch flag football. <laughs> I looked you at you. Did you see that out. in professional yeah. sports? <laughs> I imagine you. It'd make a lot of mothers happy. I yeah, think. Yeah, probably would. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that gives you some of some ideas that are out there. Here um, kind of gives you uh, this map, and you've had that shows how the barbarians were beginning to. Uh, 
uh, to bring up the empire. If you've got that on your website, or you're looking at it now, hopefully, you begin to see that uh, Spain here, the Visigoths, the Vis uh, you have the, I think these were the, um, the Vandals were over here, if I remember correctly, one of the maps. Uh, you just got the Saxons are over here. Uh, you've got the uh, Ostrogoths over here. The Huns come in and invade from this direction. Uh, here's the old Byzantine Empire that takes uh, Greece here, with his Turkey. So you, you've got the divisions of the empire. You've got what's happening to the Roman Empire in the West is falling under these various barbarians. And every time you have this kind of invasion, you have the church having to rethink itself and adapt. And, and this, this is one of the things crisis tends to do. It helps you, helps you to uh, adapt in one way. Sometimes it helps you purge. <clears throat> Sometimes you're not purging. Maybe you are purging. But you're having to adapt or recreate or rethink or reform it, format what uh, is going on in your, your own personal life, in this case, the life of the church. Some of the values that were being traded by the Latin and Germanic uh, tribes here. You have the Latin civilization. It's based upon Greco-Roman civilization coming out of philosophical works and, and the, uh, the religion of the Greek and Roman Empire. Converted over and then into Christianity. Now, even though Christianity came up in a Jewish heritage, by this time it has adapted to a Greco-Roman Empire and and the Greco-Roman influence was there in Jerusalem at the birth of Christianity. And there are certainly strong Greek tendencies to be found within Christianity. But by this point, by the 5th century, 6th century, strong influences of Platonic philosophy have filtrated into the theological systems. And so Neoplatonic and Platonic ideas are being uh, filtered in here. So now you're bringing into that idea and that form the Teutonic now ideas. Platonic meaning Greek philosopher Plato, I hope you understand, and Teutonic meaning the German influences. And so you have life and vigor, sense of honor, love of liberty, spirit of freedom, individuality, the very things that are kind of innate within uh, our own philosophical systems of, of the American system. So that those are the characteristics that have uh, been brought in. Now, with the overthrow of the Roman Empire, the monastics, and this is where we go back to some of the work that you did last week, talking about monasticism and thinking about, as you read through some of the lecture materials that I posted for you, it wasn't just necessarily about Anthony in the fourth century and fifth century, who, fourth century, who begins to develop his isolationism, but it's also about the development of monasticism that begins to go out and, mission, and do missionary work. And here's where, like for example, you have the great uh, St. Patrick, you know, that, and, and the whole idea, there's books written about how how the uh, Irish saved civilization. Well, it was actually the monks that, you know, they got out as far west as they could. Ireland, and even, you know, if they could get beyond that, they would have. And getting out on the very extreme ends of the empire were able to save a lot of the Christian materials that, um, that would have gotten destroyed and, and during the Dark Ages because, you know, hey, the barbarians had no love for our materials, Christian materials and books and learning. Um, they were more after gold and power, and they wanted to reap a little bit of this uh, influence of the, of the Romans. They got exposed to it. There, um, there were times where the Romans actually employed uh, some of these uh, uh, Germans to fight on their side in troops. But uh, and they got a taste of that stuff, and they wanted it for themselves. And they said, you know, we can whip these guys. <laughs> Eventually they did. But uh, during the period of missionary endeavor, and that's beginning with the, uh, in the middle of the 6th century forward, you have a lot of things going on within the context of the church. I won't take a lot of time with some of the big names, but uh, you should be looking at that and understanding that the church wasn't standing still. In spite of the barbarians that have taken over the church, 
The church is out there evangelizing and Christianizing these who are coming in. So you've got, for example, uh, the training of various missionaries. They're bringing in a new place of discipline, and the church becomes a civilizing component. It's bringing its moral values in. <coughs> it, it, so it's bringing <coughs> education in. It, it's bringing familiarity. And uh, slowly but surely, the old uh, Norse gods, the old German gods, give way to the Christian god. And, in some cases, you will see holy days and holidays that have been borrowed and traded off. For example, our Christmas tree and Christmas wreath, you know, some of those things have both Roman and German background to them. And there are even times uh, that the missionaries would borrow the name or borrow the saint, I mean, borrow their patron god and plaster a saint's name on them to show how similar they were. And so there was this trading off. It was a technique that made Christianity a little more palatable, particularly when they had then uh, female deities. It was easy then to trade off Mary as the female component over against uh, a goddess then. And so often Mary would come out looking like some of the goddesses of, of, of these uh, tribes as they came in with their deities, male and female deities. It took time, but eventually Christianity won over. As the medieval period begins to progress, we get into the arrangement of powers and how these powers begin to flank themselves out. And mainly the power that begins to rise is the power that was what is today France, or the land of the Franks, or the Carolinan Empire, which begins with Pepin, Charles Martel, Pepin the Short, and then Charlemagne. And Charlemagne will be the big name that will kind of bring things together. So, okay, having covered that much, I want to now back off from that and talk a little bit more about the development of the church. And I have been talking about uh, the organization of the church that was built around political structure of the Roman government, the breakdown of patriarchs into... Uh, divisions of the archbishop, the providences, and then the bishoprics, and from there then into the lower episcopal orders. Now the clergy's duties were the, that of pastoral, sacerdotal, giving out the, the sacraments, administrative, and political, varying degrees, but mainly at the local church level. The archbishop was the judge of all clergy within his charge, the priest was seen as the shepherd of the people, and then he assigned out his task to his staff. At this point in the beginning of the church, women certainly had a place of service and often served as deaconesses within the context of the church. Because of its wedding with the church, the um, clergy was now given certain privileges. Uh, clergy was given tax exemption, they were exempt from civil responsibilities, from the demands of civil law, and but they answered then to church law. Now that is not unlike what clergy still are able to enjoy today. Um, you, back during the draft uh, in the 60s, during the Vietnam War era, uh, I had an exemption because of a 4D classification. I was given a clergy or divinity uh, exemption because I was a pastor. Pastors, uh, if they own their own house, they uh, don't have to claim the money that comes into them for parsonage rent, so there's still a little bit of tax benefit that come, and that comes out of a long tradition. Uh, you see it goes all the way back here to Charlemagne, that clergy get a certain kind of exemption from government, at least in the West. I don't know how that fares out in other localities. Uh, it could be that France, England, and some of these, although England, the, friend, uh, the clergy are still a part of the support of the crown, so uh, there's still something going on with that. But uh, we had tax support for clergy here in the United States until 
the last colony to abolish it was Massachusetts about 1834. But once uh, Thomas Jefferson came in and the First Amendment was passed, where the state and the church would be separated, uh, the idea was the state would not dictate to the church. That was the idea. For example, we'll see this as we look later into the Protestant Reformation, and that countries would align themselves with a church. Italy obviously was Catholic, uh, Spain was Catholic, France was Catholic, but Germany was divided half and half between Lutheran and Catholic. Uh, Switzerland was divided between Catholic and Protestant. England became Anglican. When you got into America, the earliest stages of America was lined up, the colonies were lined up in the South, Georgia, North, South Carolina, Virginia, New York, um, were all Anglican. New England followed the Protestant uh, Puritan forms and they became congregational. Maryland was established as a colony for the Catholics so that they could be established. Print, uh, Del, uh, the Del Mar Peninsula was Anglican and you get into Pennsylvania, that was a free colony and you could be anything there but it was primarily Quaker, but it, you could have been anything there. And so by that we meant that the colony was following the same pattern that the English have been following and Europe had been following in terms of alignment with a denomination. Well, that only occurred after we have the Reformation coming in. But uh, as we... Early on, when we're, we're looking at this, the whole countries were Catholic. They were beginning to align themselves as Catholic, and the church was getting stronger and stronger as it began to align itself with government. Um, in terms of the monastic orders that began to develop, I, oh, I should, let me go back to this. Um, there were certain rules for preparation on the part of the church uh, in regard to the clergy. The clergy were expected to have a certain level of training, although there was a period in time which the priests were both uneducated or evil or both. And uh, you, you go through that, you go through waves of it. Um, sometimes the priests would actually be runaway criminals or slaves who thought that they could you know, secure their identity and hide it in a monastery somewhere. Um, the clergy, at times during the 6th century and 7th century, you would find an enormous amount of immorality, slothfulness, gluttony, robbery. Uh, there was the selling of offices called simony that was going on often within the clergy. So there was, a, there was corruption there. And when you had corruption within the clergy, you found the laity following the same pattern. So you have the degradation that goes on when you have laxity at higher places within, within the governance of the church. Monasticism was, if you recall, a reaction to the infusion of the church and state together. Now it had, monasticism had both a positive and a negative influence upon the church. Now it started out, as you recall, as people wanting not to be involved with the church because of the engagement of government. It, it tried to preserve, in a positive way, it tried to preserve devotion and learning and did that quite well during the Dark Ages. It also provided an escape from the rigors of life and provided what we would call social security for people who were able to join the orders. It attracted, though, the corrupt, and even though they made vows, it really didn't change the way they acted in some respect. So Charlemagne, coming along in the 800s, tried to bring about a reform, but External reform doesn't always work. Reform has to come within. And so 
If you, in your reading, remember the rule of Benedict, St. Benedict, 800. This was an attempt to try to systematize the rules of the monasteries, to bring about reform, to get the monks living according to the rules. And once they got them living according to the rules, then they were able to shore up this, the, the, the corruption that was existing and the immorality that was existing within the church. There were a number of uh, Eucharistic practices that were being uh, practiced within the context of the church that came on through the merger of these uh, efforts to engulf, or I mean bring in the um, people of the outside. Uh, as we brought pagans in, you have pagan practice. This is one of the problems with church growth. You have rapid church growth, and I mentioned this before, and I want to emphasize it again, that when you bring in people with different ideas flooding into the church, you've got all this mixture, and this mixture brings a certain kind of reform of itself, not always on the positive. And that was one of the cases as the church began to bring in all these masses of pagan, you also began to include some pagan practices. Well, let me mention a few of things that began to come on. Um, the practice of saying Mass for the dead began around 800. Oh, here again, this was coming, coming alive, alive uh, through uh, paganism, who had its rituals for the dead. Uh, the sprinkling of holy water on the sick. Well, holy water is just water you bring from the spring that you consecrate. Uh, it's not water that's brought from the Holy Land. Although I have some of that. <laughs> that might be holy water, but anyway, uh, but uh, as a rule, it's just consecrated water. The beginning of the use of relics. Now, relics really became popular after the Crusades, but relics were the things that were brought back, the supposedly bones of saints, or in some cases, splinters from the cross. In one case, they had a diaper that belonged to Jesus. They even had Jesus' foreskin believe it or not. And as they had all these things, they brought them and they made these beautiful brass and gold vessels that they would put the relic in. And these are called reliquaries. And certain churches or areas would collect enormous amounts of these and people would make pilgrimages to these spots all over Europe to see the relics and this was a way of getting credits. Good credits from Jesus for visiting his foreskin, for example. <laughs> yes, believe it or not. Now, you have the baptistry. Baptisms move from the, 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 the pool to the fount. And so now you've got the sprinkling of water and the sprinkling in baptism, maybe pouring, but no longer immersion. You've got the worship of Mary and the saints, and I told you how that happened by the infusion of the pagan rituals of their deities into the practice. You have the beginning of pilgrimages, and the pilgrimage comes out of, again, getting credits. So you want to earn credits, so to speak, toward God, good works, and by then taking the pilgrimage, going to the Holy Land, visiting the holy sites, you are taking off years off of purgatory, and you're adding you know, good credits for heaven. And people did this sincerely. I'm not saying they did it. They did it out of ignorance, and they did it sincerely. They really felt that they were doing something here. And then along with this, then, you have the rise of visual aids, pictures, icons, and images, and the flourishing of this whole industry of religious arts that were beginning to fill the churches and allowing people to, to see uh, what they have heard through the biblical stories. You go to some of the great cathedrals of Europe. Yeah, I, I, have you, any of you visited some of these cathedrals where they have the icon, oh, yeah. icons oh, yeah. all over the doorways and everything? Yep. 
I mean, it tells the whole story. A lot of times it'll be Judgment Day stories uh, or uh, resurrection stories or the life of Christ stories, and um, it's a quite a you know quite a feast for the eyes to say the least. Saints will be pillared there. If you go to Notre Dame, for example, see all the gargoyles, but then along with that, it's all this icons that are all over the place and some imagery. That, that, that. The National Gallery of Art in D.C. has a tremendous number of paintings and sculptures and it's amazing how much is how there. How much is out there, isn't oh, it? Oh yeah. 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 If they ever tried to get the church out of DC, <laughs> the art museum would be <clears throat> near empty. The, <laughs> it's the, unbelievable. It was, it was the <clears throat> shrine to the Immaculate Conception. Always, yeah. it's, it's very beautiful and it has a lot of that. I just have to be careful not to call it the Cathedral to the Immaculate Reception. Yes. <laughs> so, always got have you gone to the up. National Cathedral, any of you? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's got a lot of nice windows and artwork within it, and its altars are beautiful. We, that uh, comes out of an Anglican tradition. So it's we uh, went to serve uh, during our, our DC class in our undergrad program. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the, the Sunday service there. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. Yeah, the, uh, I think it's called the altar, it's, all, it's on the left side, altar for the Holy Spirit, that particular cloister, if you got back in there. That's just, boy, it's breathtaking. I think, it, wasn't that all woodwork, if I remember correctly? I think all so. carved. I so. Yeah, it's breathtaking. Long time. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was just there last year, so I, that's why. I, I used to, like, help and assistant floors for weddings. Yeah. So she accidentally put the flowers yeah, in the altar. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, came out like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you just, <laughs> 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 you just, yeah. <laughs> like, get that yeah. out. Yeah. 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 I, I photograph weddings and I always talk, I always talk to the, to the person at the church beforehand because there are certain, you know, there are certain things that you just don't, like, I was told in one church, you can take a picture of anything you want. Do not cross this line. On the, there's literally a line on the floor. Yeah. You do not come past this line. Yeah. And you do not take a picture while they're, while they're saying their prayer to Mary. Yeah. You're not allowed to take a picture yeah. of the st statue of Mary, mm -hmm. which I found very interesting. But, you can't take pictures of the Sistine so. Chapel anymore. They sold the rights to a company in Japan so that they would restore the chapel. Really? I learned that today, too. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take pictures. I was immersed <laughs> in it. That's too bad. I had a friend send me a, um, a picture now of the restored Christ Sistine Chapel, and it's one of these where you, you know, you move all around, and you can you can uh -huh. do this, and you do this, and this. It's pretty pretty neat, just like visiting it. I oh, yeah. I've been to Rome, I've been to the Vatican, but our tour group the guy was a preacher, and he wanted to tape his preaching sessions and cut us short. We didn't get to go into the Sistine Chapel. I would have fired him. I would have voted him out. Yeah. <laughs> Off the island. Okay, well, why don't we take a break here and uh, let's take uh,